Well, unless you've been living under a rock, you know that Trump just won the 2024 presidential election. And in this video, I really want to dive into some of the aspects and some of the reasons of why this happened. I really want to focus on Gen Z here, as we do on this channel. Well, it may be a huge surprise to many, but Gen Z actually voted for president-elect in huge numbers compared to 2020 and 2016. We're going to dive into all the reasons of why this happened and the ramifications that it can have on the political landscape. And next, I really want to dive into just how bad Democrats did here in 2024 and just how big of a catastrophe this was for the entire party. We're going to talk about how Bernie Sanders saw the writing on the wall. The presidential candidate from 2016 and 2020 came out with a powerful statement that shouldn't shock anyone. And we're going to start right there. We're going to talk about Bernie Sanders' post-election statement. And we're going to talk about just exactly how he was saying the quiet part out loud. So here he says, It should come as no great surprise that a Democrat party which has abandoned working class people would find that the working class has abandoned them. First, it was the white working class, and now it is Latino and black workers as well. While the Democrat leadership defends the status quo, the American people are angry and want change. And the right. Today, while the very rich are doing phenomenally well, 60% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. And we have more income and wealth inequality than ever before. Unbelievably, real inflation accounted for weekly wages for the average American worker are actually lower now than they were 50 years ago. Today, despite an explosion in technology and worker productivity, many young people would have a worse standard of living than their parents, and many of them worry that artificial intelligence and robotics will make a bad situation even worse. Today, despite strong opposition from a majority of Americans, we continue to spend billions of funding. Today, despite spending far more per capita than other countries, we remain the only wealthy nation not to guarantee health care to all as a human right, and we pay by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. We alone, among other major countries, cannot even guarantee paid family leave and medical leave. Today, despite strong opposition from a majority of Americans, we continue to spend billions funding the extremist Netanyahu government's all-out war against the Palestinian people, which has led to the horrific humanitarian disaster of mass malnutrition, and the starvation of thousands of children. Will the big money interests and well-paid consultants who control the Democratic Party learn any real lessons from this disastrous campaign? Will they understand the pain and political alienation that tens of millions of Americans are experiencing? Do they have any idea as how we can take on this increasingly powerful oligarchy, which has taken so much economic and political power? Probably not. In the coming weeks and months, those of us concerned about grassroots democracy and economic justice need to have very serious political discussions. So yeah, I think that was absolutely powerful. I think in a nutshell, in just two pages, he basically described exactly why the Kamala Harris campaign shouldn't be surprised on how they basically got their butts kicked in this election, in which they did. Trump won the popular vote. He won over 300 electoral votes. This is a huge uh, mandate, if you will, by the American people on just what they want in their uh, government. In that statement, Bernie Sanders basically identifies these huge groups of voters that did not turn out and vote for Harris. We had working class voters, white, black, and Latino working class voters. And then we had young people. And then finally, we had Arab and Muslim Americans who did not turn out to vote for obvious reasons. All these groups had obvious reasons not to want to support the Kamala Harris campaign. Yet the Harris campaign seemed to look the other way, where we had millions and millions of working class people struggling out there. It should come to absolutely no one's surprise that President Trump's economic populism stance and identity is very easy for voters to identify, especially working class voters who are struggling paycheck to paycheck. We've learned throughout the past year on this channel that many of you guys, many of those in the audience, 
have been struggling this year in the past few years. Basically post COVID, they've been saying that grocery prices are higher, rent prices are higher. That is a very easy message to get across voters. Trump already had that message pre-packaged. He just kind of had to go up and say it again. And if we take a look where a lot of president-elect Trump's support is, it's in that Rust Belt. What happened to that Rust Belt over the past few decades? Well, we've seen millions and millions of manufacturing jobs leave in, in the past decades, all due to this neoliberalism that has taken place across party lines. We saw it first with Reagan, who really introduced this sort of globalization and outsourcing of jobs. We then saw it be on hyperdrive under Bill Clinton, which saw the economy explode. But when that economy exploded, a lot of people were left out. We saw George W. Bush kind of take that neoliberalism economic approach and kind of continue it. He really you know, went gung-ho on that. President Obama went gung-ho as well. And what did we see during the 2010s? We basically saw an enormous amount of economic inequality. We saw huge movements like Occupy Wall Street that really identified that a lot of people were struggling out there, that identified that a lot of people noticed that the wealthy were getting wealthier and wealthier, while the working class were getting poorer and poorer, losing their jobs and opportunities going overseas while those up top were making all the money. People saw the economic crisis of 2008. They really saw how a lot of those wealthy people really didn't have any consequences. They banked off that real estate boom and when it all came crashing down, they were still left holding a lot of their wealth. And I think a lot of people saw that and that was a very eye-opening experience. It really was a moment where a lot of people were like, wait, we need to stop shipping our jobs overseas. And this is where Trump comes in. In 2016 or 2015, right, when he makes his announcement that he's gonna run for president, he takes this economic populism approach, really identifying that a lot of people across the country, especially in those battleground states like Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, were hurt and they felt like they didn't have a party anymore because the party that they voted for the Democrats, they really embraced that neoliberalism approach, basically having corporations with a laissez-faire approach when it comes to outsourcing jobs overseas. Trump took that and ran. And as we know, it worked for him. He got tons of support. The MAGA movement was born. He basically got an entire electorate that was part of the Democrats and he put it under his belt. But what we also saw in 2016, which was very interesting, we saw another movement, another populist movement, but this time on the left. It was led by Bernie Sanders, a independent senator from Vermont, someone that a lot of people didn't really know of, but he had a lot of experience in political office already. Very well-spoken and very down-to-earth guy. A lot of people liked him. He was gaining a lot of grassroots supports, not to mention he was gaining a lot of new supporters. Remember all those people that were in Occupy Wall Street? Well, they now had a new figurehead. They now had a hero to look up to in Bernie Sanders. And if you remember during those times in 2016, uh, Bernie Sanders got a lot of support very fast and very quick. Even with Hillary being the top of the ticket. But unfortunately for the Democrats, they decided to take, I guess, the easy approach. Stick with this neoliberalism economic approach. So they kind of stuck with Hillary, yet we saw this huge grassroots opportunity that was right in front of them. We saw so many new supporters right in front of them emerge out of nowhere for Bernie Sanders. Yet the Democrats decided not to go for that route. They decided to go with a candidate that had a lot of baggage that was very unlikable, and they were overconfident saying that she would be elected. And we know the story there. Trump was elected, and then that paved the way for Trump's next four years. Uh, COVID happened, and then a lot of craziness happened, right? Then we had Biden come in. Um, who also kind of took a similar approach to Trump actually in that more economic populism approach, pumping the brakes on that neo 
liberalism economic approach. So COVID happens and then we're left with this horrible inflation across the world and especially in our country. A lot of people were already hurt, you know, during the decades and years before uh, COVID happened. This really cemented the deal for Trump, I think. I think this, the writing was on the wall. And if Democrats did not embrace this sort of populist approach in economic policy, then they would be left with a huge defeat. And I think that's exactly what we happen. For, for example, Bernie Sanders, he has a more uh, democratic, socialistic economic approach, which is a populist approach. But nevertheless, it identifies radical change. While we saw Trump's economic populism still being very, very popular, and that's exactly what we saw on election day. People want that economic populism. I'm not gonna talk about policies and whose policy is better, right? We're not even gonna get in that sort of political rabbit hole. But I will say it's very evident, it's very easy to identify that Trump's messaging is very, very simple and easy to understand. Harris's messaging was kind of all over the place. It really didn't identify a one sole issue besides abortion. And well, when election day came, we noticed that, well, a lot of voters were really focused on the economy. They were focused on, you know, their wallets, their families' livelihoods. And that's kind of what happened. And I really think this economic populism really resonates with Gen Z. We've talked about on this channel many times how Gen Z is going to have a harder time than their parents when it comes to finding a good job, when it comes to retirement, when it comes to starting a family, and when it comes to buying a house. Now, I will say Harris did identify that, and she did create um, policy messaging, identifying ways to, uh, I guess, lower housing costs. but. Trump's already had this economic populism since 2015. It was easy for the voters to identify that. Not to mention Trump had a secret weapon here. He really targeted a lot of young Gen Z men. He went on all these podcasts, going on these TikToks, gaining millions and millions of views every single week. We're talking about going on Seth Rogen's podcast, which I think it got over like, what, 50 million views on YouTube, which is, absolutely absurd. He went on many videos with Aiden Ross. He went with many videos with the Nelk Boys, if, if that's what they're called, right? Um, he also went on uh, more interviews with people like Theo Vaughn. Uh, I think he appeared with Logan or Jake Paul. He, he did a lot of these things. He knew that these influencers had a stronghold on a young G male electorate. And I think that's exactly what we saw. If we look at the numbers here, we'll see that Trump gained heavily in Gen Z support from his previous last two times running. This is a huge gain on one young demographic group. This has always been an extremely reliable demographic for Democrats, the young vote. But this time, Trump had that secret weapon. He went on all those uh, podcasts and male influencers, and I think that really, really helped him. In an election that is based off tiny margins, that young male vote definitely helped him put him over the edge in states like Georgia, Pennsylvania, and Michigan and Wisconsin. If we look at the ramifications of this, I think we can really identify with, with everything that Bernie said, which really resonates with exactly what we're seeing in the numbers and just the overall enthusiasm and, and kind of the aftermath of this election. It seems like neoliberalism is dead. Neoliberalistic economic policies are dead. This means that people don't want manufacturing to be outsourced. People don't want their jobs to go to China or go to India. This is exactly what is happening. Time will tell what happens in these next four years and how Democrats are actually going to respond to this. In Bernie's eyes, he kind of says nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to change and they're going to kind of tend continue what they've been doing for the past, what, 20 to 30 years. Continue with that neoliberalistic approach. One thing that I think is really important to identify is if we go back to 2016, Bernie Sanders had a lot of new supporters. And if we fast forward to 2024, a lot of those supporters that Bernie had in 2016 voted for Trump in 2024. 
identifying this populist approach is very popular in the country right now. And if the Democrats don't embrace it, they could be left losing a lot of elections going forward. Time will tell what happens in these next four years. But I would put a big bet that if we see some sort of financial hardship or financial crisis, um, hopefully that doesn't happen. But if it does, we could likely see another resurgence of this populistic approach, but this time on the left side. So Bernie's democratic socialism could make a huge return and a brand new face could sort of catapult that and be the spokesperson and be the new face of the Democratic Party if the Democrats actually take Bernie's advice and follow that path. Well, I want to see what you guys think about this. Do you agree with what Bernie Sanders said? And what are your thoughts on this huge Democratic loss? Is this something that we're going to see next time and next time and next time? Or will there be a huge shift here? Let me know in the comment section below. And like we've talked about on this channel, we're not going to pop the champagne or cry doom and gloom over these results. Uh, I want to see what you guys say in the, in the comment section. You'll see plenty of videos on the left and the right that are going to give you their opinion. Well, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. Be sure to hit that like button, hit the subscribe button. It helps the channel out and it shines a spotlight on issues and topics like this. Like always, we'll be back with another video. Stay informed out there.